you're all wondering where Pastor is this morning. Pastor is on a plane to Orlando in two hours. Pastor um, was at a two-day conference in Texas this week from Monday and Tuesday. And uh, he, his appendix burst. It, it burst, but praise the Lord, all is well. Amen. All is well, and, and, and throughout my sermon, I'm gonna, give you, I'm gonna give you some testimonies of the grace of God on our lives and in our lives and the connections of God. When you, are, when you are serving him, when you are full of God, when you're full of his word, when you want his perfect will in your life and you live for him, he makes sure that the people there are there in the right space at the right time, ready to help you out, ready to come to your aid. And so, um, you know, Monday he got sick and he thought it was the flu. And then Tuesday, uh, let's see, Tuesday he, he fell a little better, but then by three o'clock he was done. He, he was back in his hotel room, laid out, cold, sweat, chills, everything. Well, around Tuesday afternoon, Jean and I and Jeannie, uh, we started praying in the office for somebody else someone totally else and some other people in the church. And all of a sudden, the Spirit of God hit me. I started praying for my husband our, and our families, all of our families, the three of us. And so we just had a Holy Ghost time in that office. It was no longer than 15 minutes. And the Spirit of God just dropped in on us, and it was, it was wonderful. And then that night at around 8 o'clock, and I wasn't really thinking or praying at that time, all of a sudden something hit me in my spirit. And the Lord had given me a revelation of what the angels do for us. And I won't go into that this morning, but he's just given me a revelation of what they do for us. And especially in the financial realm. But then the Lord opened my eyes and said, they're not just to move for you and influence people for good and for your advantage in the financial realm. They're to move for you in every realm. And when he spoke that to me, I rose up and I said, now I commission you angels, you go forth now and bring all the aid and the support to my husband that he needs. This is before I knew that his appendix had burst. I just knew something was wrong. And I, I started to know it wasn't the flu because when my husband says he's sick and he wants to come home, I told him, you're not coming home, not in the way, not in the condition you're in. And so um, anyways, I commissioned the angels to go get the support he needed in just an hour or so. He texted me and said, I'm on to the hospital. I'm going to the hospital. So his appendix had burst. It probably burst on Monday. It probably, it probably had been burst for 24 hours because he was in a lot of pain. But God, but God came in. He had some of the very best doctors in the nation in, in that medical center in Texas where he was near the Dallas airport. Um, he had some of the best medical doctors that did his surgery. A uh, wonderful surgeon. His name was Dr. Swanson. Uh, looks like... Uh, you know, some tall Texan with a big, wide mustache, you know. <laughs> Probably has a ranch, but he was very good and was very good with my husband the whole time. He, and uh, I will tell you this, the grace of God, and that's what we were talking about. That's what we're, we're continuing on, is, is breaking free. The series Breaking Free. And the grace of God does for you what you cannot do for yourself. Is that right? That's really a very easy to understand, uh, simple definition. Uh, it is the grace of God does for you what you cannot physically, spiritually, or mentally do for yourself. That's why Jesus came down. That's why he sent his son. That's why he had to die for you, to save you eternally, physically, to give you salvation, sozo, life. So the grace of God, that was a free gift. That's something that you had no control over. God came down in the form of flesh, right? And he came down and did for us what we can't do for ourselves. I couldn't do anything for my husband. I couldn't reach him. I, I couldn't do anything but pray. And I sent, I sent a few people prayers. I said, now, I need, I need your prayer. I called Mary Fran, and, and they're on it. They're on it. Thank God for our prayers. Amen. Thank God for Shirley. Thank God for Betty. Thank God for these ladies that, that pray on Monday night. And so, um, you know, throughout the, throughout the session, um, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a couple of little uh, testimonies here in a minute, because don't you want to hear the goodness of God when, you know, well, well, why did that happen to pastor? 
I thought that if you live righteously before the Lord and you, and you do everything you're supposed to do, that you'll have no troubles. Well, we might as well die and go to heaven. Then we'll have no, no troubles hit us. In the world, you will have tribulations, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And so it says, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. It doesn't say that he will escape you always from the, from the valley, but he did say that you'll walk through it. Amen. And so the angels went out and the, actually the, the Lord gave pastor a word of knowledge in his hotel room and said, your appendix burst, get to the hospital. And so that's what he did. Um, you, know, you know, it's sad that the hospital didn't believe him when he got there. They made him wait in the emergency room for over an hour and a half. It's very sad because he didn't come in screaming and crying and throwing a fit. You know, some people are just very pain tolerant. And he, he's got his game face on, you know, he, he's just, he's just pain tolerant, but he says, I'm serious. My appendix burst. And they're like, yeah, you wouldn't be acting like that if your appendix burst, but it had. And then the doctor said, wow, you're, you're bad off. He's like, I tried to tell you this for an hour and a half. So anyways, <laughs> praise the Lord for God though. So the grace of God is the power of God to break every chain. It's the power of God to break every stronghold. The grace of God does for you what you cannot do for yourself. The grace of God is the power of God that, that is in your life to break every chain, to break every stronghold, to break every addiction. It is, it is the, great, the power that's on your life that you couldn't bring to yourself. It is what God did for you that you can't do for yourself. And so... The Bible says, and even in the, in the area of resisting sin, the Bible says that sin now has no dominion over you. Now, it has no control over you. Now, let's go to Romans 6, 11 through 18 real quick here, and I just want to uh, read this to you. This is a great chapter for all you people that want to rightly divide the truth between grace, between walking right standing before God, uprightly before the Lord, and the grace in your life to do so. Amen? So likewise, verse 11, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore, the, the next verse says, therefore, do not what? Do not let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in its love. The common, the connotation there is that if it told you to do not let it reign in your mortal body, that would connotate to me that I have the ability and I have the authority to say no. I don't have to do this. Now, when, if I'm a child of the devil, you know, you got your nature of your father, the devil, you don't always have that control. You don't, you don't always have because you're, you're, you're in that nature. But now we're in a new nature. So he said, don't let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in its lust. And do not present, do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin. But do what? Present yourself to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not have dominion over you. For you are not under law, but you're under grace. Well, the reason that sin doesn't have the right to have dominion over you is because the grace of God is in your life to make you free from it, to make you free from its control, to give you the ability to say no to it and walk away from it. Amen. And then it says, do you not know? I'm sorry. 15, what then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? Certainly not. So like Reverend Mark Shell said Wednesday night, if you're looking for a license to sin, you know, you're, 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 looking, you're, you're in the wrong place. You're, you're just in the wrong place. I question, I question a person's salvation sometimes if they're always wanting to know how they can get away with this, that, and the other and have a little bit of fire insurance because they don't want to go to hell. I just question that. 
Now, I'm not questioning your salvation or anybody in this room, but I'm saying if you're always trying to see how close you can get to hell and make heaven, I question if you really have the life of God in you at all. <laughs> Amen? So God said, God said, what then? Shall we go ahead and sin because we're not under law now, but under grace? Certainly not. Do you not know, verse 16, I'm sorry, Colleen, but keep rolling. Do you not know that to whom you present yourself a slave to obey, you are that one slave whom you obey, whether sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness? Amen. But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, this is where the grace of God came in. Though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine in which, in which you were delivered. And having been set what? Having been set free from sin, you become slaves of righteousness. So grace was provided for your complete freedom from sin and the results of it. So you are free from sin, not free to sin. Does that make sense? All right, amen. I love to be free from sin. And you don't have to wake up every day and sin a little. You don't have to. You can go throughout your whole day and live as unto God. Amen, I'm not saying you're gonna make some mistakes sometimes that you don't know about. We're not talking about those things. We're just talking about on purpose, practicing, amen? So, because there has been a transfer that has taken place. Now, when you have money in one account in your bank or in someone else's account and they transfer it to yours, it comes out of their account, am I correct? It's gone and into your account. That's what the Lord said in Colossians through Paul, chapter one, verse 12 and 13. You've got that ready for me? Or do I have to find it in my Bible? There we go. Thank you, Colleen. Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be a partaker of the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has delivered us. Not he's going to. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us, my Bible says, and transferred us into the kingdom of the Son of his love. So we've been transferred out of darkness and into light. Transferred from one account to the other. Amen? So we're no longer in the dark world. We're no longer subject to the prince of the darkness of the air. We're no longer subject to the ruler of this world. We're no longer subject to the God of this world because we're out of that account. And we've been transferred into the new account, into the new, into the kingdom of who? The Son, Jesus Christ, of his love. So now we operate under different rules. Now we operate under different terms. Now we under, operate under the grace of God that frees us from sin. Amen? Amen. So, everybody say this with me. I have been delivered from all the power of darkness, and I've been translated into the kingdom of the Son of His love. Now, I'm just going to quote this. You don't have to throw it up unless you're really fast. Luke 10, 19, Jesus told the disciples, and He's telling you too, it's for all believers. He said, Behold, I give you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. I'm really glad that he included that third one over all the power of the enemy. Because if he had just stopped at serpents and scorpions, it had left me a little bit, a little bit gray there, a little bit vague. Just serpents and scorpions? There's a lot more going on here than serpents and scorpions. But he said, and over all the power of the enemy. And nothing shall by any means hurt you. When sickness tries to attach itself to you, when anything tries to attach itself to you, when somebody's words try to condemn you and bring you into harm, you quote that verse and said, he's given me the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt me. And that's the scripture that I prayed over pastor. Now, the reason and I say this in, in all the love in my heart. The reason that I don't tell everybody in the church and put on Facebook everything that happens in our life is because, because our church people as a whole can become very alarmed at something like that. Obviously, you heard the response this morning when I said as appendix burst, everyone was like, oh, everyone had to take a breath, you know. 
But the important thing to us, and it's nothing against anyone anywhere, the important thing to us at a time like that is that the spirit of faith is around us and spoken over us and prayed over us. Not, oh Lord Jesus, not crying, not I feel so sorry for pastor, oh poor pastor. I can't have any of that in my life. I, I just don't have any place for it because it, it, it hurts us. And of course, you know, when the shock hits me, I have to grab myself quickly and I have to get myself under the shelter and, and, and the word of God and, and put my eyes and my focus because, because it's trying to grab me into that place that so many people walk in. So I need people that goes, okay, this is how we pray for pastor. This is what prayer for pastor looks like. We take his word like Mark Shell. We pray the word. Now, Father God, you said the number of thy days I will fulfill. You said with love long life. This was my prayer. This is how I prayed. You said with long life, I'll satisfy you and show you my salvation. With long life, you'll satisfy my husband. He is not satisfied right now. He is not ready to go. With long life, you'll satisfy him and show him your salvation. You said the number of his days you'll fulfill. When he's ready to go, he can go, but he said he's not ready, so he's not going. And this is the word of God. This is the word of God. This is the word of God. Word of God. Jeremiah says, I I will heal thee of thy wounds. I will be your physician. I will be your great healer. I saw Jesus. I said, Jesus, you take your hands and you guide and put your hands on top of the doctors. No complications, no messes up, nothing, nothing in Jesus' name. And the angels went in and got that support. At, at one point in time, my husband calls me back a couple days later, a day after surgery, and he says, I need you to pray. I need you to pray that the nurses that are on staff and they change shifts at night, I need you to pray that they'll be efficient with me because there's ones that are on staff that they don't really know what they're doing. They're young, they're in training, and they leave these patients with these nurses. I know this by you know, being there with my mother. I had to watch every move that some of them made because they weren't all at the same level. And so he said, I need you to pray that some of them will be efficient because because the tube that was going into his stomach, draining all the toy, the poisons and the toxins, you know, they were ripping the patch off. They didn't know how to necessarily put it back on. And so I said, angels, go out and get the aid and support that he needs. And I call and speak forth efficient nurses now in Jesus' name. And so then he calls me back the next day, and he says that a young, a young girl, doesn't matter what nationality, young girl walks in, obviously she was a little shy, a little bit still in training, and she was getting ready to change the patch that were the, the, the stomach tube. And he knew that it was because she, she really didn't know how to do it. It had been her first time doing something like that. And at that very moment, and the doctor and the surgeon doesn't come in every day and check on him. But at that very moment, Dr. Swanson, the surgeon, not, not the PCP, but the surgeon, walked into the room at the very moment that she had placed her hands on the patch, and he said, wait, let me show you how this is done. And he changed the patch for pastor. And that was uh, the last time they had to change that patch was when Dr. Swanson did it. So this is what I'm talking about. This is for you. These angels are here to go to work for you. The Bible says in Hebrews 10, he says, are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for the heirs of salvation? And so that's what they did. They went and got what, what we needed. And so I'm going to tell you a really funny story. You ready for a funny story? This is funny. A doctor walked in, not a doctor, but a nurse walked in to, to check his lungs and respirators and all of that stuff. And he walked in yesterday or two days ago in the morning, and he asked, never had seen Pastor Pastor, never seen him before. He walks in and he says, are you in the, in the military? And Pastor says, no. He says, oh. And he says, why do you ask? He says, because you carry an authoritative figure about you. There's an authoritative something about you. I just thought you were a general or something in the military. <laughs> Retired general, he did. And so pastor just smiled. He says, I'm a pastor of a church. He's like, oh my gosh. And so he proceeds to tell him 
and just pour his heart out to him. And he says, my grandson has fallen off the deep end. We didn't raise him this way. And he went on and on and on. And, you know, my first thought was that he meant, you meant he was like not doing good spiritually, right? He was out in the world or he'd fallen off the deep end. That's what I think of. But then he said, he's going to Rima Bible Training Center <laughs> in Oklahoma. And he says, ever since he's come back from his first year, he heads out on Saturday with a backpack on his back with tracks and goes downtown and he tells people about Jesus and he witnesses. He said, we really didn't raise him like that. He's just a little out there. And I'm sure you understand that this is just not right. He's just over the top. And pastors is having, he's very cool. He's listening to the whole story, you know, not sympathizing with him, but he is listening. And then finally, he just starts talking him through all of that. And finally, he says, I am a graduate from Rama Bible Training Center. <laughs> oh, and the, the, the guy just, his mouth, he's a tall guy. He, he, he about crumbled to his knees and was like, you got to be kidding me. But... You see the connections there where that young grandson probably was praying, Lord, someone help my family know I'm not a kooky crazy and falling off the deep end. And his grandfather meets a graduate from Raymond Bible Training Center, and he talks him through and prays with him and helps him to see why his grandson is so on fire. And, and not only to say that, Pastor learns out that the assistant the assistant CEO to the CEO of the whole medical center that runs the place at night, her, I believe her name is Linda. She's a, she's a graduate of Rama Bible Training Center. So there's some other things I can't talk about right now. They're just wonderful that, that God, God did while we were there. But I will say this really quick. I will say this, this is awesome. I know maybe all of you don't know this, and this will be the first time you hear it. Again, it's better for me to sometimes tell you things later when the manifestation of things manifests so you can see what God has done. So two years ago, or a year ago, this past October, so not this past October, but a year ago, October, my husband had CHF. He had congestive heart failure he, uh, while we were in Tennessee. Um, I won't go into all the details. I mean, there's no blockages. His veins have always been clean. He has no blockages anywhere in his heart. But he had congestive heart failure. And he almost died when he was in Tennessee. And I never told anybody. That's when, the, it's when uh, who was here? The little trumpet guy, um, Annie and Kevin Durant. They were already scheduled to be here because we were on vacation. So it just turned out that it was perfect in that kind of timing. But um, he was in a bad, bad state. And just to explain to you, his heart, um, because of his heart failing, there's an ejection fraction rate of your heart on, that measures the, the amount of blood that's pushed through on each beat. And so the normal rate is 55%. 55%. A strong normal rate is 55%. So um, his rate was 25 or below. He was not dead, but he was close to dead. And so all this time we've been working on and thanking the Lord and working on both sides to get that ejection fraction back up so he can actually function. Uh, he's had some... He's had, some, he's had some difficult time just preaching, just preaching because of, of that. And so, but God has been wonderful. The anointing of God coming on him, carrying him through, it hasn't been a bed of roses for us. But I will say this, three days ago, they had a cardiologist on standby in the room during surgery to make sure his heart was going to take the surgery and be okay in case he needed help. His heart was awesome, had no complications, and the cardiologist came into his room later and said, good news for you, Mr. Morgan, your heart ejection fraction rate is at 55%. Amen. Amen. Let's just give God glory now. Amen. Amen. So the scripture that we have been standing on all this time he has two of them, and I've forgotten kind of the, the gist of the, the, the other one, but basically wait on the Lord, not wait on him to do something, but minister to the Lord. 
and he shall strengthen thy heart. And so that's what we have spoken over him, a strong heart. And God is strengthening every cell in your body, strengthening your heart. So he is actually doing great. He was like a racehorse at the gate yesterday, trying to get out of that hospital. So he's doing great. So I thought you guys would enjoy that. I want to read this to you. Amen. Amen. That's just the way it will be for us. That's the way it has to be. That's the way. We have a, we have a destiny on our lives. We have a purpose. He takes us out. He takes you guys out. I mean, that's his plan. That doesn't mean that would happen. It just means if he can destroy us, he, he would like to destroy the 200 people below us. You know, it's just the way he is. But that's not going to happen. So, amen. So, um, I want to read 2 Corinthians 9, 8 to you. This is about the grace of God. Can you throw that up on the screen for me, Miss Colleen? And God is able to make all grace, everybody say all grace, all grace. abound towards you that you always having all sufficiency in all things may have an abundance for every good work. So he, uh, Ephesians 2.10 says this, but we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works that he has prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. I have a question for everybody out there, everybody struggling with anything, physical, spiritual, mental, whatever. If that Bible verse says, God, uh, what did I, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, why did he create us? For what? For good works that we should walk in them. If you are sick and lying out on a bed and you can't function, how can you walk? You can't walk in the good works God's given you to do. But if we are created for those good works, that's something you can confess over your life. I was created for good works so that I can walk in them, which you prepared way beforehand that I should walk in them. So that's another scripture we confess over ourselves. We were created for one reason, for good works that we should walk in them. Now, Jesus, that's your deal. That's what you said about us. That's what we're going to do. We're not going to be lying in a hospital bed and, and struggling with this, that, and the other. You know, things may come our way, but God always causes us to triumph. Amen? So let's read that. Nope. Let's go back. 1 Corinthians 9, 8. God is able to make all grace. Everybody say, all grace. All grace. And now what is grace? Grace does for you what you can't do for yourself. Pastor couldn't do anything about that in the natural. I couldn't do anything, but he brought all the people together. And then I found contacts in Texas that I had just met recently, and they went to visit him in the hospital. So it was just awesome. It had some Holy Ghost times together. So that was wonderful. And then, so I want to read this to you in, a, in another version. And God, let me read this to you. The basic definition of grace is undeserved favor and blessing. It's undeserved favor and blessing from God. Now, uh, another, another definition for that that I read was that he affords advantages for you, for your success. So when you have an advantage over someone, that means you have a higher yeah, a higher uh, capability of like getting the position or getting the job or whatever. It says he affords you an advantage over the situation for, your, for you to be successful. So if it's undeserved favor and it's blessing and affording you an extra advantage in order for you to be successful, now listen to the scripture. God is able, now think about every area of your life. Think about finances, think about your body, think about healing. God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. Say this with me. God's able to bless me abundantly. So that in all things at all times, I have all that I need. I can abound in every good work. Say this with me. And God will generously provide all that I need. Then I will always have everything I need and plenty left over to share with others. Isn't that a great translation? And that's just what happened to him in the hospital. God abundantly supplied everything he needed so he could abound and so he could be on a, 
a, a, a plane because he wasn't supposed to come home this early, but he just healed very quickly. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. So I'm glad he's coming home. Thank you, Jesus. So now I want to just, uh, I want to transfer just a minute here. And uh, that was just my introduction. But that's okay, because my main sermon's not that long. <laughs> Amen? Amen. That's just, that's just free. Spirit of God. Grace. The grace does in you what, what uh, does for you, what you cannot do for yourself. So uh, we were talking about being transferred out from darkness into light. Go to John 1. The Lord just made this, this very real to me a long time ago. I don't think that I've ever preached it. may have a little bit. Um, John 1, start with verse 1, okay? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He, not it, He, Jesus Christ, was in the beginning with God. Jesus is referred to as the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus is God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. Why do you think God said in Genesis, let us? Amen. Let us make man in our, in our image, our image. He wasn't talking to himself, his arm and his leg. He was talking to Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Jesus is the word. The Holy Spirit hovered over and brought it to pass. I don't know how all that works. I just know that's what happened. It doesn't matter. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him, nothing was made that was made. Now, just that scripture, I got a revelation of the fact that if everything was made through Jesus, that nothing that you see exists except through what he made, I see my body as being the perfect, uh, you know, Jesus is the best person ever to, to be able to work on my body. Because he's the one that made it. The, the, the builder of something is the best person to fix the problem when something breaks. Amen. And so Jesus made your body. He said all things were made and created through him. Nothing that was made was not made except through Jesus. So when you go through a problem, you, sometimes you don't know. You say, Jesus, I thank you for fixing it. You command whatever's going on wrong to go. And you see Jesus taking care of it and just taking, fixing it and it leaving. You know, amen, amen. So then he says, in him was what? Life. And the life was the light of men. Where is he? That's right. So what's in you? Life and light. In me is life. And the life is the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. I'm going to jump down to... 11, um, he came to his own and his own did not receive him, but as many as received him. To them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, in his name. Amen. So say this, in him was life, and that life was the light of men. Now, I had something written down where, verse 9, let's see. Um, the true light, amen. That was the true light which gives light, verse 9, John 1, 9. That was the true light which gives light to every man coming into the world. Every man has the opportunity to embrace the light of God. Amen? All right, now go to, um, can you read, can you put up verse 5 in, um, the Amplified, John 1, 5. Is it, is it hard to do that quickly? And the light shines on. Think about the lights in you, right? And the light shines on in the darkness. For the darkness has never overpowered it, put it out or absorbed it or appropriated it, and it is unreceptive to it. So you can say this. The darkness can never overpower or put out or absorb the light that's in me. When Darkness can never run out light, but light always absorbs darkness. Amen? You turn a light switch on, even if it's dim, 
it still gives light, some light in the room. But darkness can't just creep in without the light switch going off. Amen? So the, the truth is, is that the light of God and the life of God is in you. And you need to see that, that it's working in you. And we're going to learn more about that in just a second. Now go to 1 John. Uh, actually, go to John 17 first. Being that you're already in that same gospel. And I wanted to read this to you. Verse 17, uh, chapter 17, verse 20 through 23. I do not pray for these alone. He's talking about us now. But also for those who will believe in me through their word. Have you believed in God through your word? Yes. That they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I'm in you, that they also may be one in us that the world may believe that you sent me, and the glory which you gave me I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one. Don't you love it when Jesus prays for you? His prayers are awesome. And the glory which you have uh, gave me I have given them, verse 22, that they may be one just as we are one. Verse 23, I in them and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one. Now, think about that. Jesus said, I'm in them and you're in me. So if Jesus is in you and God's in Jesus, who else is in you? All, all, all of it, right? God's in Jesus. All that transfers, Jesus is in you through the Holy Spirit. So you've got God in you. Is that safe to say? Because Jesus said, this is how I pray, that I am in them, you're in me, and we're all now one. Amen. And that's what you need to see when you're going through stuff that if the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead, Romans 8 says, the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead, that brought him up and out of hell dwells in me. That same spirit dwelling in me, he will quicken and make alive this old mortal body. Amen. And that's how we pray at our house. We pray the word of what he said. Amen. And then go to 1 John. Now, this is what I love. 1 John 1, 5. And we are still talking about breaking free. We are still talking. We're going to talk about a huge aspect of living in freedom in your life in every area. And we're going to hit that today in this angle. 1 John 1, 5. Here we go. This is the message we have heard from him. And we declare to you that what? God is light. And in him is no darkness at all. And so when I read that verse, the Lord showed me that if, if, I, if Jesus is in me and God is in Jesus and God and Jesus are in me and God is light and in him is no darkness at all and he's in me, then in me is no darkness at all. That's where I position myself from. That's where I pray from. Yes, we can, our lights can grow dim. They can grow dim. And I'm going to show you how, that, that, the, how you can avoid that. But if you will stay close to the Lord and you will do, you know, and obey, obey him and do these things that I'm about ready to say, which is very easy, that light that's in you will ever shine so bright and that same light that's in him, and there's no darkness that can penetrate it or appropriate or absorb it or overpower, that same light is in you. And that's what you need to see, and that's what you need to walk in, and that's the authority that you need to walk in every day, that this is what God has said about me. Amen? All right. So, go to 1 John 2.6. Now, 1 John is an awesome book. It talks about your fellowship with God. We can talk all day about in Christ. We are, you know, we are children of God, and we are in relationship with him, and those are awesome sermons, and you need them. You need to dwell on them all the time because if you're not looking at who you are, you forget who you are. If you don't comb your hair in the morning, you don't know what your face looks like when you go away. You forget what manner of man you look like. And so if you forget to look in the law of liberty, you forget who you are and Satan takes advantage of you. So, 1 John 2, 6. 
Here is something that has freed us in our life. In Pastor and I's life, again, I'm not going to preach something that, hasn't, that I'm not walking in or working in, working with right now, <laughs> or that I don't understand. There are things in the Bible I don't understand. There's a few things, but I don't preach those things. I preach the things that God gives me light. God gives me light on. Amen? Okay, so 1 John 2, 6 and 10. He who says he abides in him ought himself to walk just as he walked. Now, if you say that you abide in God, God says that you need to walk like me. Amen? That's a command that he gives you. And so 10, here is how you do this. He who loves his brother abides in the what? In the light. God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. Now he's saying he who loves his brother abides in what? How do you abide every day in the light of God where darkness cannot, cannot successfully penetrate and overpower you and take you out before your time? Right here, he who loves his brother abides in the light continually. And there is no cause for what? For stumbling in him. Verse 11, Miss Colleen. But he who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he's going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. So this is what we surmise to. He who abides in love, Colleen, you can throw that frame up. He who abides in love, abides in God, abides in the light. Did you make that frame, Miss Colleen? That's okay. It's not a scripture. It's just the frame that you had, you had typed out. But he who abides in love, say that. He who abides in love, abides in light, therefore abides in God. Amen? Amen. So then go to 1 John 3, 10 and 11. So I'm going somewhere with this. This is something that the Lord has made really real in our homes, the way we treat each other, the way we talk to each other, the, the way we treat... You know, it's, it's, it's easier to trash the person closest to you. You're not as apt to, to trash somebody or, or to just to kind of, you're not trashing them. You're just a little more free around them because you're familiar with them. And the more familiar you are with someone, the more free you feel to be around them. But just because you're familiar with somebody, just because you feel better around somebody, doesn't mean you are to treat them with any less respect. Amen? Amen? But you do deal with them on a daily basis, so you are constantly walking that out in your life. So, is in this the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest? It's one or the other. There's two people on earth, children of God, children of the devil. Say that with me. Children of God, children of the devil. Everybody in this room is, that's born again is my sister or brother in the Lord. Every one of you. We're family. We're going to be together forever. So you need to get used to me, and I need to get used to you, because I'm going to be living with you. I'm going to be living with you. I'm going to be hanging with you. We're going to be fellowshipping together. Amen? In this, the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. Whoever does not practice righteousness, well, I'm the righteousness of God. Yes, you are. The grace of God did for you what you couldn't do for yourself. He made you righteous. It was a gift through the blood of the Lamb. But he said, whoever does not practice now righteousness, which you are free now from sin, so it's time to practice. You can be just like God. You can practice that. Is not of God, nor is he who does not love his brother. Amen? So then verse 14 through 23 says this. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother abides in death. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. By this we know love because he laid down his life for us. And we also ought to what? Lay down our lives for the brethren. Verse 18, my little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Let us not only love in word and in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Let's show them that we love them. And now here is what will help you. 
And by this we know, verse 19, that we are of the truth. And you shall assure your own hearts before yourself, okay, and before him. For if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart. He knows all things. But beloved, if your heart doesn't condemn you, we have confidence toward God. And then whatever you ask, you receive from him because you keep his commandments and you do those things that are pleasing in his sight. Oh, Pastor Lisa, I so wish you hadn't read that scripture. Oh gosh, now you're talking about the law. Got to keep all those commandments and do things that are pleasing in his sight. No, this is really, really simple. He gave you two simple things to do now. He says, a new cam commandment I give unto you. W what is it? Love God with all your heart, your soul, and your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Are you going to rob from yourself? Are you going to cheat yourself? Are you going to purposely hurt yourself? Then why would you do that to your neighbor? That's all God's saying. He says the Ten Commandments are fulfilled in the law of love. If you love your neighbor, you're not going to rob from them. You're not going to steal from them. You're not going to lie to them. You're not going to commit adultery with them. If you love them, you won't do all those Ten Commandments. Is that right? So it's very easy, very simple. So then he says if you love your brother, then your heart is assured before God. In this we have confidence when we pray. Whatever then we ask, we receive because we keep his commandments. What are they? There's two. We just said what they are. Because we keep those commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. And this is his commandment, verse 23. Number one, we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ. That is loving the Lord with all your heart. You believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and you love one another as he gave us commandment. Amen. Now, um, I just wanted to read Romans 13, 10 to you. Throw that up on the screen real quick. You don't have to turn there. What does that say? Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is what? The fulfillment of the law. Now, Brother Hagen, I'm going to tell a quick story of something Brother Hagen told. When uh, he was in a house ministering to a, actually a pastor's wife, I believe. She was a pastor's wife. And she had a little six-year-old daughter that was severely, severely um, afflicted with epileptic seizures. Severely afflicted with epileptic seizures. And she just, they, they've been to all kinds of doctors, just couldn't get control over it. And it was a very, very, very bad situation. She'd throw herself down and she'd thrash and she'd hurt herself. And anyway, she's sitting at dinner with Brother Hagen one night, a bunch of people around the table, and uh, she told... She told Brother Hagen, she says, I hate my mother-in-law. I hate her because she's born again. She's born again. She's a pastor's wife. The mother-in-law, you know, is the mother of the pastor, and, and she's born again. And, but she's always coming over to the house, and she's always trying to run things, always trying to cook dinner for her, her, her boy, you know. And so she just hates her intruding into her life like that. And she says, I hate my mother-in-law. And Brother Hagin says, well, the Bible says that if you hate your brother or your mother-in-law, you're abiding in death. You're not even saved. He says, but I, I don't think that you truly hate her. He says, I want you to look at me in my eyes and, and say to me, I hate my mother-in-law. And then look down in your heart and see if something's scratching on the inside. So she looked at Brother Hagin and she said, I hate my mother-in-law. And he said, what happened? He, she said, oh. I felt really bad inside. Something, something, something's, something, and always something scratching when I say that. He says, that's because you really don't hate her. You shouldn't use those terms. It's not good to keep going down that path. But the truth is you don't like what she does. But the reason your daughter can't get healed is because you're not walking in love. You're not walking in light. So there has darkness that's been allowed to penetrate the bubble. It's just been allowed to penetrate. And you know, you have no standing authority to tell Satan to leave when you've invited him into your life and you say, I hate my mother-in-law. So you just need to get that under the blood and you just need to say, well, maybe I don't like what she does, but I don't want her to go to hell. I don't, you know, she's not going to hell, but I don't really hate her because the love of God is shed abroad in my heart. And so she got it all right. She said, you're right. She said, I want my daughter to be healed. I am going to love my uh, mother-in-law. I may not like her or everything she does, but I'll never say that again. And within two weeks, her daughter 
was 100% totally healed. And Brother Hagen told her, the next time she has an epileptic seizure, you say, Satan, in the name of Jesus, I'm walking in love. That's the only commandment that God's given me now, to love him and to love my brother. And so now I adjure you in the name of Jesus, get off my child and don't ever return in this house again. He says, that's what you're to tell Satan when that seizure hits her. A week later, a few days later, that seizure hit the little girl, and she said, Satan, I'm telling you right now, I'm walking in love. I don't hate my mother-in-law. I'm, I'm obeying the commandment that God gave me, that one, that two commandments. I love him. I love my brother. Get out of my house and don't penetrate this house again. And she immediately stopped her activity, and it never came back never came back. So this is the thing that sometimes we take, too, we take too lightly in our lives. We take too lightly in our lives. You may not like what people do. You know, may not like what they say. You may not like what your family member's doing, but you don't hate them. You love them with the love of the Lord because God loved them enough to die for them. And then you pray for them, for God to deal with them. And God will take care of them, and he'll take care of you. Amen? But it has brought great victory in our household. We don't hate anybody, but sometimes you harbor things. And that's just as bad. Amen? Amen? Amen. So let me read this to you. This verse maybe has never been read. This is my second to last verse. And this verse probably has never been read in this church. So what I'm about to do... I consider to be gutsy, but I'm okay with it because the Lord told me to do it. So I answer to him. I don't answer to you. Amen. I love you, but some of you may be uncomfortable in a minute. But I want to tell you that I love you. I love you, and God loves you, and his grace is sufficient for each and every one of you to walk out of whatever binds you. Amen. Here we go, 1 Thessalonians 4. Finally then, brethren, I'm just going to read down until I'm ready to finish. Finally then, brethren, we urge and exhort you. Remember what I just read in Romans 13, 10? Love does no harm to his neighbor. When you always need to ask yourself, if is what I'm about to say or do going to bring harm to this individual? What I'm about to say about them, what I'm about to say to them, what I'm about to do to them, is it going to bring harm to their business, to, to, to anything, to their reputation? And maybe they are a scoundrel, but you need to always ask yourself, am I about to do harm to this person in any way? So, finally then, brethren, we urge and exhort you in the Lord Jesus that you should abound more and more just as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God. For you know what commandments we gave you through the Lord Jesus, what we were just talking about in 1 John. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality. Everybody knows what that is? That's sex outside of marriage. Okay, that's easy. For this is the will of God that your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in passion of the lust like Gentiles who do not know God, that no one, and this is the part I want to read to you, and you see, verse 6, that no one should take advantage of and defraud his brother in this matter. The Bible says, God says, that when you commit sex outside of marriage, he says that you are taking advantage of that person. It doesn't matter what the world system says. It doesn't matter what's okay in our age. The moral attitude of the Bible and the principles that we live by, they never become old-fashioned right? We talked about that a couple weeks ago. So God said that when you commit sex outside of marriage, you are defrauding and hurting that other person. He said defraud means to rob, 
or to steal from. And so robbing means you are robbing their purity from them. Well, we already know they've had sex with somebody else, so they're not pure, so what's the matter? Okay, that's not the point. The Bible says that you, you as a born-again believer, are defrauding. You're robbing and you're taking advantage. Are you walking in love? No, you're not. Are you doing harm to your neighbor? You cannot walk in the blessings of God if that's to continue. You are not loving that person. You are taking advantage of them. And that's what God said. Now, here's the verse that I wish wasn't in the Bible, but it's the next one I'm about to read. Are you ready? Is this okay? All right, it is the truth. And no, we haven't read this before. Because the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also forewarned you and testified. But God did not call us to uncleanness, but in holiness. Verse 8, therefore, he who rejects this, that we just does not reject man, but who? But God. Uh, who has also given us his Holy Spirit. Um, I don't want to define that verse for you. But you don't want to be on that side. You don't want to be on that side. You want to be on the side where you receive him. We live by faith. Grace through what? Faith. Grace does for us what we can't do for ourselves. It's redeemed us, it's, it's washed us in his blood, but faith is our response in obedience to that power of God that he's given us. And said, so, Jesus, it's your way, it's not my way. Like we were singing this morning, I give myself away so you can use me, amen? All right, so everybody okay with me? All right, that is in, the, that is in your Bible, so we, Another, another uh, definition for the word defraud is to violate. Do not violate your brother and your sister by this type of activity. Sexual immorality is a big deal to God. He said, your bodies are the temple of the Holy Ghost. Don't you know your body is the temple of me? I'm the one that is housed in your body, in your being. He said, don't do this to me. So, amen, praise the Lord. But I will encourage you today that the grace of God that has set you free is the power of God to make it work for you the way God wants it to work for you. Amen? And so the reason sometimes that people sin is because they don't trust him. They're afraid that his word doesn't work. Amen? So you need to get before the Lord and say, I want to trust you with my life. Sometimes people shack up with people because they're afraid that they'll be on the street. But that's not trusting God. If God said, don't do something, my first response is, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to sleep on the street before I do that, and God will provide. Because his grace makes all provision, what? Available to us. I read that in 2 Corinthians 9, 8. So let me read this, 2 Timothy, and I'm done. 2 Timothy 2, 20, 21. You ready? Here we go. 2 Timothy 2.21, and I need to go to Safari. I have another. All right, here we go. But in a great house, that's the house of God, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay. Some are for, dishon some are for honor, and some are for dishonor. Therefore, if anyone will cleanse himself from the latter or from the dishonorable ones, he will be a vessel for honor sanctified and useful, everybody say useful. useful, useful for the master, prepared for every good work. We talked about work, walking in the good works of God. God wants us, he loves you, yes, you're his child, yes, all these things are true, but do you want to be useful for the master? He said to cleanse yourself from the dishonorable and reach out for the honorable if you'll cleanse yourself from the latter, you will become then a vessel for honor, sanctified and what? Useful for the master, prepared to do his good works. Amen. Amen. All right, I'm going to read this in another one. Uh, let's see. In a wealthy home, some utensils are made of gold and silver, and some are made of wood and clay. The expensive utensils are used for special occasions, and the cheap ones for everyday use. And if you keep yourself pure, 
you will be a special utensil for honorable use for the master. Amen? Amen. So today, um, we want that in our lives. And um, I want to go back to Colossians 1, 12, Colleen. We're going to take communion. So if you'll bring the elements down. And uh, Miss Colleen, if you'll play very softly some, some music, that would be great. But instead of going to the traditional, I can, I can quote the traditional 1 Corinthians 11, and that's great. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. But today, I want to do Colossians. When we take the elements, it's always to remind us of what God did in us through Jesus Christ. We're always to keep that in the forefront of our remembrance. The, the bread resembling the body that was broken for you now your body doesn't have to be broken. Your body doesn't have to be broken because Jesus already paid all the consequence for you, the result of sin. And what you're doing is you're taking that piece of bread and saying, Jesus, thank you for breaking your body for me. Thank you for, for taking all my sicknesses. Thank you for taking all my diseases on you. Thank you for taking all my pain. Isaiah 53 says he took our infirmities and he bore our sicknesses. And by his stripes, we were healed. Amen. And uh, when you take the grape juice, it reminds you of the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus that washes every sin, that cleanses every sin. The blood of Jesus that you have redemption through. That blood was not just not any human blood. It was blood th flowing through his veins that was from the Father God. Amen. And Whatever was in that blood, it made it right, and it paid the price. Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified every one of us, today we're going to be a what? In a symbolized sense. We're going to be a partaker of the inheritance of the saints in the what? In the light. He has delivered us all. Say that. He's delivered us all from the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of the Son of His love. Amen. Next, next verse, 14. Calling, In whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. So if everyone has been served, who has not been served, actually, as of yet? Well, everybody has been served, or mostly. Amen. All right. Praise the Lord. Praise God. Father, we thank you. We thank you for the blood. We thank you for your blood, Jesus. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to read this. Throw up on the screen Isaiah 53 real quick for me and follow down with me, Colleen. Isaiah 53, chapter 53. And then we're going to pray and thank God for his goodness, his mercy. Who believed our report? And whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He'll grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness, and when we see him, there's no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. Verse 4, surely he has borne our griefs or our sicknesses, and he's carried our sorrows and our pains. We esteemed him stricken by God and afflicted, but he was wounded for who? Our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The punishment or the chastisement for our peace, the punishment that was due on you was put on him. He is your substitute. Now you don't have to bear it. The punishment for your soul, your body, and your spirit to be at peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way, but the Lord has laid on him what? The iniquity of us all. Father, as we bow our head in prayer, we, we, we thank you. We thank you for the awesome thing that your grace did for us that we could not do for ourselves. 
And right now, everybody say this with me. Say, Heavenly Father, I receive the grace of God, the abundant provision of God in my life, in every area, spiritually, soulishly, for my mind and for my body. I receive that grace of God. And I receive what Jesus did for me in dying on the cross and that he rose for me. And now I receive him into my life. Jesus, have your way in my life and the life of my family. And I thank you that eternal life and the God kind of life and light now abides in me. In Jesus' name, go ahead and take the bread. Say, Lord, thank you for your body that was broken for me. And that by those bruises, I was healed. I do not need to bear again what you've already borne for me. I refuse to bear the burden of sickness, of being broke, of being poor, of bearing the burden of all that was placed on you because you did it for me in my place. And so now I thank you that because of that broken body, mine can be healed. And I receive it today. Thank you for the blood that cleanses and washes me from every sin. And I receive that forgiveness and I receive you cleansing me from all unrighteousness in Jesus' name.